way of envisioning our mind and the whole project of yoga, of meditation, of stilling the mind. And he says, um, think of the mind as a lake. This is in his Raja Yoga. It's, ver it's very helpful. He says, the bottom of a lake we cannot see because its surface is covered with ripples. The water is rippled, so we can't see down to the bottom. It is only possible for us to catch a glimpse of the bottom when the ripples have subsided and the water is calm. If the water is muddy or is agitated all the time, the bottom will not be seen. If it is clear and there are no waves, we shall see the bottom. The bottom of the lake, he says, this is beautiful, it's clear, right? We, can, we can't see, if, if you've ever been to a pond or a lake on a completely calm day when the, gla the, the surface of the water is like glass, if you look down, and the water is clear, you can see straight down to the bottom, maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 feet directly, you can see right down. So Swami Vivekananda suggests the, the bottom of the lake is our own true self. And what is the water? What is the water of the lake? It's the chitta, that is our mind stuff, the stuff of our mind in which all the thoughts arise. And what are the waves? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, right, the vrittis, the thought, all the thoughts, all the a activity, all the waves in our mind. So we cannot, then the an analogy is clear, we cannot see our own true self. We do not realize who we are. Why? Because the water of the mind is disturbed. If that water can be made perfectly calm and placid and silent, then our true self stands revealed to us. And then he points out also this, these gunas, the sattva, rajas, and tamas, which we've been touching on. Again, he says the mind is in three states, one of which is darkness, called tamas, found in brutes and idiots, and people like me <laughs> sometimes. All of us. It's there, it's there in all of us from time to time. It only acts to injure. No other idea comes into that state of mind. Then there is the active state of mind, rajas. That's always the antidote for this tamas, for this darkness, for this uh, indolence. Uh, the, the chief motives of rajas are power and enjoyment. I will be powerful and rule others. Then there's the state called sattva. We're still reading Swamiji here. Serenity, calmness, in which the waves cease and the water of the mind lake becomes clear. Now, here's what's interesting. He says, it is not inactive. The state of tamas is inactivity. The state of sattva, the waves are not arising in the mind stuff, and the, the mind is perfectly clear and calm, but it is not inactive, rather intensely active. Intensely active. It is the greatest manifestation of power to be calm. It is easy to be active, he's, he points out. Yes, it's easy to be active, to restrain, to restrain all that power which wants to go out and manifest as activity and thought and talking. Let the reins go and the horses will run away with you. Anyone can do that. But he who can stop the plunging horses is the strong person, which requires the greater strength. Letting go or restraining, he asks. <laughs> we have some horses, and uh, we can just let them go, and they'll take the chariot pell-mell down the hill and maybe end up in a crash at the bottom. Or restraining. It takes great strength, perhaps, to restrain those horses, the horses of our senses, our body, and our mind, all that. And yet, if it's perfectly restrained, it's a state of intense calmness, yet it's intense activity where everything is possible. The calm person is not the person who is dull. You must not mistake sattva for dullness or laziness. The calm person is the one who has control over the mind waves. Activity is the manifestation of inferior strength, calmness of the superior. So this is a, a beautiful way of understanding uh, that calmness is this calmness, this silence, 
is not a state of dullness. It's a state of intense activity. It's a state of, it's almost paradoxical. On the one hand, it's activity, and yet it's silent and perfectly calm. So uh, it's a state to which we aspire, and sometimes it may be helpful also to practice restraining our uh, organ of speech. Um, there's, uh, it, it's, um, people even take a vow. There's monks who don't speak at all in, in both the Christian and the uh, Hindu traditions. Uh, the monks who they have might have a little chalkboard to do a, bit, a little bit of communication. Otherwise, no speaking at all. Uh, Swami Savarpriyananda, though, he tells, a, he tells a very funny story of a monk, one of our monks in our order, who visited his uh, center where he was uh, visiting. Uh, uh, and uh, he shared a room with him for some days. And this monk was strictly observing a vow of silence. He was not speaking with anyone. If he had to, at most, he might write something on a little slip of paper. Otherwise, he was practicing very strict silence and not talking at all. But uh, he told us that at night, they were sharing a room. And at night, in his sleep, he was constantly talking, <laughs> talking and talking in his, in his dreams, in his sleep. And so in the morning, uh, the, the, the Swami told him, hey, uh, so, uh, brother, you, you know you're, you're practicing silence during the day, but at night, you're constantly talking. And he, was, he wouldn't believe it. <laughs> he couldn't believe that he was talking at night because he was so sincere. But so that uh, it, it takes a long time to to be ready for that kind of state of, of really not talking, because it's not about physically restraining the uh, organ of speech. It's about a much deeper uh, restraining the, um, the anxiety to be heard, as Thomas Merton puts it. Thomas Merton was a Trappist monk, uh, of quite well known. He was a brilliant writer. and. Uh, one of his books is called uh, Thoughts in Solitude. He spent some time as a hermit. He was in a in the Trappist monastery where they observed strict silence. They didn't talk at all. They've now found that it's not wise to do that. And they have uh, have certain hours of strict silence and certain hours when the monks may talk. And in fact, the monks, though they weren't talking with their lips, they had developed their own elaborate sign language. So they would communicate with each other with sign language because talking was forbidden. So now they're allowed to talk some, at some of the time. But um, he points out, it is not speaking that breaks our silence, but the anxiety to be heard. It always struck me. It's, it's, we can speak and not break silence. It's this anxiety to be heard. I have to be heard. I have to speak. I want to tell. I have to tell all these things. Let me read a little, a beautiful passage from his thoughts in solitude, this uh, thoughts that he wrote down while he was in solitude and silence. When I am liberated by silence, when I am no longer involved in the measurement of life, but in the living of it, I can discover a form of prayer in which there is effectively no distraction. My whole life becomes a prayer. My whole silence is full of prayer. Let me seek then the gift of silence and poverty and solitude, where everything I touch is turned into prayer, where the sky is my prayer, the birds are my prayer. The wind in the trees is my prayer. For God is all in all. How beautiful. Can you imagine if, uh, if as we spend some time in silence and the mind begins to quiet down and we begin to hear, uh, the, hear the the wind as prayer, and the, we see that the sky is prayer, and the birds chirping are prayer, and everything we touch becomes prayer. As we see the divine shining through everything, as we see the mother peeping through everything, everything becomes prayer in this silence.
Another way of conceiving of this silence uh, is there's two ways of understanding silence. Silence as, a, as an absence or silence as a fullness. And I think that harkens back to our discussion of the tamas versus sattva. Um, a silence as being a th no thought of anything, but there's also a silence that can be a, a complete thought of one thing. And if we make that one thing God, then it's in a complete fullness when the sky becomes prayer and the birds become prayer and the sun becomes, everything becomes prayer. Mm. And f a great help for that is the mantra. For those who have, of us who have been initiated or if we aren't initiated and we, but we have selected for ourselves a mantra, repeating a mantra in solitude, it becomes the, it starts to become the only thought. It starts to become the only sound we hear. And it is very much akin to the sound of silence. And in fact, uh, the mantra also contains silence. The mantra is, uh, as it were, cradled in silence. The universal mantra, the first mantra, is Om. And Om is said to have four quarters. The akara, the, the a, uh, the ukara, the, the second letter, u, the makara, the m, the, the m sound at the end, and then the fourth is silence. That's part of the mantra, is this silence. And Sri Ramakrishna used to say that uh, the om merges into silence. He would say that, um, of course, in those days, the uh, people who were sincere seekers, oftentimes they would have a certain ritual they did three times a day, uh, particularly in the Brahmin families. They would have this, what they call the Sandhya Vandana. It was a quite a complex series of prayers and uh, chants and meditations and all that. And part of that was the prayer, the Gayatri prayer, which is a, a, a short, a powerful prayer for spiritual illumination. And so he would say the Sandhya, this complex of rituals and prayers merges in the Gayatri. And the Gayatri merges in Om. Gayatri begins and ends in Om. So the, ho the whole prayer of the Gayatri merges into, and then it just becomes Om. And Om in Samadhi. Om ends, culminates in Samadhi. And uh, which is another name for silence. When the individual soul has merged in the Oh, super soul. It is like the sound of a bell, says Sri Ramakrishna. The yogi, by following in the trail of the sound Om, gradually merges himself or herself in the Supreme Brahman. Well, I'd like to close uh, the topic today by reading a few passages from Swami Vivekananda, from his letters. Uh, this letter is written uh, to Mary Hale, his American sister, with whom he shared so much of, on the one hand, uh, simple brotherly love and chit-chat, and on the other, uh, revelations of his own the spiritual understanding, revelations of his own spiritual condition. And he was writing to her, uh, and he writes, things are not humming for you just now. I am so sorry. That is, I am trying to be, for I cannot be sorry for anything anymore. <laughs> Interesting. He, on the one hand, he, he loves Mary very much. They're like brother and sister, so I'm sorry. But then he realizes that actually he's gone beyond that. I'm trying to be, for I cannot be sorry for anything anymore. I am attaining peace that passeth understanding, which is neither joy nor sorrow, but something above them both. Now I am nearing that peace the eternal silence. So he's giving a, a profound hint to the uh, states to which he, I think, often touched and, and where he often dwelt. But then he would come down to this world and worked incredibly hard to 
put in a lever for the good of humanity, as it were, as he, as he said, uh, impelled by the power of the Divine Mother, by the command of the Divine Mother. But then he would come to this point where he cannot be sorry anymore because he is nearing that peace, the eternal silence. Now I mean to see things as they are, everything in that peace, perfect in its way. He goes on, this is the great lesson that we are here to learn through myriads of births and heavens and hells, that there is nothing to be asked for, to, desired for beyond one's self, capital S. This is the lesson, nothing to be asked for, nothing to be sought for, nothing to be desired, except our own true self, which is the peace that passeth understanding, which is infinite love, which is perfection. The greatest thing I can obtain is myself. I am free, therefore I require none else for my happiness. Alone through eternity, because I was free, am free, and will remain free forever. This is Vedantism. I preached the theory so long, but oh joy, Mary, my dear sister, I am realizing it now every day. Yes, I am. I am free, alone, alone. I am the one without a second. So it's interesting because we, f we understand that Swamiji was an illumined soul all the time. But it seems that in the midst of work, perhaps uh, that um, constant awareness would dim slightly. And then towards the end of his life, it became ever stronger and stronger, as we see reflected in this letter. One more short uh, excerpt from his famous letter to Josephine MacLeod, which was written, this was written in 28th March, 1900, 20 days later, 21 days later, 18th April, 1900. He wrote, oh, it is so calm. My thoughts seem to come from a great, great distance in the interior of my own heart. They seem like faint, distant whispers, and peace is upon everything. Sweet, sweet peace. Like that one feels for a few moments just before falling into sleep, when things are seen and felt like shadows, without fear, without love, without emotion. Peace that one feels alone, surrounded with statues and pictures. I come, Lord, I come. In that state of calmness, one's own thoughts seem to come from a great distance. We are far beyond the mind, far beyond the thoughts. The thoughts may be arising from a great distance and nothing can disturb that calm. And what is, our, what is the one call? What is the one need? What is the one desire? I come, Lord, I come. I think that's enough for today. Thank you very much.
Thank you. That was that was lovely. Uh, from that uh, text is from what from the Psalms, isn't it? From the Bible, the Psalms: "Be still and know that I am God." Varda Pranas. I've just repeated uh, the same line, repeated again and again. It's beautiful. Next week, our speaker will be Swami Sarvadevananda, and his topic is the Achina tree, the tree that nobody knows, the unknown tree, or the un unrecognized, unrecognizable tree. And um, we have our uh, regular classes continuing Tuesday through Thursday nights and also Tuesday afternoons. Um, any other announcements you can think of? Uh, it's a Krishna Puja coming up in San Diego uh, around the 24th of August, but we're not sure yet if it's going to be in person or online only. Uh, if it's online only, then of course it's easy to join. Uh, if it's going to be in person, then it's a wonderful experience. So it depends a little on the uh, latest. Uh, do we have time for a, a question and comments? If anyone has a, a burning question or comment, uh, you can take one or two. Uh, Pretty, could you get the microphone? Hi, Swami. Oh, is this working? Just a second. Yep. It will be shortly. OK. Hello, here we go. Hi, Swami, my name is Thais, um, and my question was, last Tuesday, I was hanging out with someone that went to, I don't remember if it was a three-month or a three-week silence retreat, and it kind of felt like, you know, all the words that he hadn't been spoken were like coming out now that he was no longer doing the retreat. Uh, and like he just like couldn't stop talking, and I don't say this to be like, oh, that dude sucks, you know, like he's fine. I just um, feel like I've experienced this in my own practice, where sometimes if I intensified like God-seeking activities, then you know if I have to go back out into the world, the world kind of comes back twofold. You know what I mean? Um, so my question was, do you have any like suggestions or techniques to kind of like manage this bounce back? You know what I mean? That right, makes sense. right. That's a great. That's a great question, Thais. Um, and we do. We do understand uh, that as we. Uh, that's why generally, uh, we we want to follow what's called the middle path. Uh, and Buddha gave the example of a vena, and the strings on the vena. If the strings are too loose you don't get any sound, or take a guitar. If the strings are too loose, you don't get a sound. If the strings are too tight, they snap. Uh, and likewise, on the one it's true, it's a, it's a balance, because on the one hand, we do want, in, if we're real seekers, we want to do intense spiritual disciplines. Yet we have to be careful not to overdo it. Uh, and especially in the beginning of spiritual life, earlier stages, we can get reactions. Um, a, a, a good example I can give from my own life uh, and it was here. I had come here. It was long before I became a monk. Not long before means a few years before. And I had a really good meditation. I felt really peaceful. I felt so joyful. And I got into my car and I drove back to my apartment on the freeway. And somebody cut me off on the freeway. And immediately, I was consumed with rage. I was so angry. And I floored the accelerator to catch up with them and you know, do something. And then somehow I managed to catch myself and think, wait, what am I doing? What's going on? I had such a good meditation. Why am I now so angry? How could this be? Uh, so obviously, it, it <laughs> something's wrong if your meditation makes you that angry. Um, and one senior monk told me what probably what happened is, uh, in the meditation, you get a taste of peace, which maybe you haven't tasted much in your whole life. You never tasted that kind of peace that you, we get in spiritual practice. We start tasting a higher peace, a higher joy. But it's still fleeting. And then something disturbs it. And in this case, it was uh, driving on the freeway, and that peace which I th started to taste was disturbed. It was taken away. And that created this reaction of anger that, oh, that peace that I, I just had and I tasted it, it was so beautiful. Now it's been, so that kind of reaction 
come. So I think it's partly just go forward. Um, it, these reactions will come. Um, but to be gentle with ourselves, recognize that these are reactions to spiritual practice. Um, as we do spiritual practice, we, we are, uh, as Holy Mother put it, un unwinding the spool. We've, we've wrapped thread around a spool of all kinds of different things, all the good things we've done, all the bad things we've done, all the positive and negative are wrapped up there. And as we go on doing spiritual practice, we're unspooling it. And we're, we're becoming free. But so it, reactions will come, absolutely. If you're interested, there's a wonderful book called Meditation and Spiritual Life by Swami Yatishwarananda, in which he discusses at some length uh, this issue of reactions to spiritual practice. Any other question or comments? So maybe there are some online questions if you want to take. You want to read it to me? Sure. One or two. Oh. I see one from Neti Neti. <laughs> <laughs> Please ask, answer my question about it, but I don't see a question. Yeah, I see it. I used to sit for meditation for hours and I gained an ability. I didn't ask for it, that I was able to hear people's thoughts. I was very scared that I stopped my deep meditation practice. And thank goodness that ability is gone. Well. Um, yes, uh, Swami Vivekananda, this happened to Swami Vivekananda, and Sri Ramakrishna told him, you stop your meditation for a few days. But he didn't say stop it forever. So you can take it up again. Uh, true, that would be a very disturbing uh, result. Uh, perhaps your meditation needs to be, uh, probably it sounds like you need the guidance of a teacher, uh, if you have got one, um, and um, focus your meditation on the divine, n not just on silence or, or something like that. And uh, that's what I would suggest for Niti Niti. Uh, probably that's enough. I th really appreciate all of you coming to uh, um, share in my exploration of silence and peace. And I'll close with a chant. Om Madhuvatartayate Madhuksharanti Sindhavah Madhvi Irna Santvo Shadhihi Madhu Nakta Mutoshasi Madhu Mat Parthi Bhagam Rajah Madhu Dyaurastu Nafpita Madhu Mano Vanaspatir Madhu Magam Astu Suryah Madhvir Gavo Bhavantunah Om Shanti 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 Sweet blow the winds, and the very oceans give forth blessedness. May the herbs and plants bring us health and happiness. Sweet unto us be the nights and dawns. May every particle of Mother Earth be charged with blessing, and may the heavens shower us with benediction. Sweet unto us be the noble forest trees, Sweet unto us be the radiant sun. Sweet unto us be all living creation. Om, peace, peace, peace.